I need some more people to come on and praise God. If you believe that he deserves it, then somebody ought to praise him. Praise him because he kept you all week. Praise him because he woke you up this morning. Praise him because he started you on your way. Praise him because he's been good to you. Praise him because he's God all by himself. My hallelujah belongs to God. If you can't praise him for yourself, praise him for me then. Praise the Lord God Almighty. Because he's good. Because he's wonderful. Because he's loving. Because he's forgiving. Because he's merciful. Because he's kind. Because he's compassionate because he's long-suffering my hallelujah belongs to you thank you when I woke up this morning I had a heart and a mind to come and praise you I'm glad that I was in my right mind when I woke up had the activity of my limbs got a reasonable portion of health and strength I just want to thank you for healing virtues healing mercy we thank you for doctors, but healing comes from you. You said, I am Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord thy God that healeth thee. Thank you for healing. Thank you for being God. Lord, we pray for our country. It's in a shutdown right now. Somebody's not going to get a holiday paycheck. I pray for them right now. That you would bless them and help them to understand that Christmas is not in the paycheck. It's in Jesus. And I thank you today for all the blessings that you've bestowed upon us. Now we place the service in your hands. Whatever is accomplished, we'll say yes to your will. For these few short moments, be glorified. Because all of the glory belongs to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And we give thanks. If you're not ashamed, go ahead and say praise God. Praise God. And amen. You can be seated in the house. Let me just real quickly thank Pastor Darren Brake in his absence. <laughs> for preaching and all of you who are faithful and been faithful while I'm away. I told you, you visit when I'm, when I'm here. Don't go visiting when I'm gone. So I'm glad that you've been faithful. As we approach the Christmas season, I begin to ask God what I should preach about for Christmas. And in that process, I thought about the fact that we had just finished a series on the scandal of the cross. In addition, since Wednesday, June 20th, I've been preaching a series entitled Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. And then just before that, I did 31 messages using the title, Will the Real God Please Stand Up? And in those series, I taught directly and indirectly that God the Father did not desire or demand the death of his dearly beloved son. And furthermore, that Jesus was not a sadomasochist who wanted to die, but he voluntarily gave his life to complete his mission. And yet all that we have ever heard and been taught is that God required Jesus to die and that Jesus came only and specifically to die, even though that was not the doctrine of the church for the first 1,100 years of existence. So just touch somebody and say, Bishop's back, bringing that stuff again. Uh, I talk to somebody who raises a very pertinent and powerful question. If God didn't desire or demand Jesus' death and Jesus didn't come into the world primarily or only to die, then why did he come? And while looking at the biblical reasons that he came, we also have a list of reasons to celebrate Christmas because Christmas is the celebration of Jesus coming of God in the flesh, in the person of Jesus the Christ. So why did Jesus come? And remember, I, I haven't been here for a while, so I, I'm going to be acting up. I don't know how to act. Uh, some of y'all been here every Sunday. Your praise is gone, but mine is just rising up. 
then I, I got to preach a little bit quick because I did the first service. My legs are a little tired, no pain or whatever. But I got a little seat up here in case I need to sit down. Would that be all right with you? Okay. And then after service, I'm, I'm not going to stay around and hug you because I need to uh, do therapy tomorrow. And then, But next Sunday, I'm going to hug the makeup off your face. Oh, it's going to be good. That's going to be good. I can hardly wait. But if you can just give me a little bit and God will do what he needs to do to get me back where we need to go. But, you know, he's been gracious already. I know y'all, some of y'all surprised to see me walking and walking without the cane almost. God is good. He's a good God. And, and so some of y'all, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you right now, don't be saying nothing to me. Don't be talking to me. Because some folks, I know y'all already, well, you know, you're not going to play no more racquetball. That's why I got surgery. I plan to, to, to burn out, not to rust out. So I asked my doctor when I got, am I going to be able to play racquetball again? He said, absolutely. So that's the reason why I went in. I plan to live my life till I can't live it no more. But anyway, that raises a powerful question. If it's very difficult to rank these reasons in terms of importance, so I've listed them in a loose order of importance, and I gave 20 reasons that we've been working on. And Pastor Darren been preaching my notes, so if you didn't like it, it, it was me. It wasn't him. And remember, most of these reasons have nothing to do with Jesus paying debt to anybody. And over the past three Sundays, he's done an excellent job. But let me just go back. Um, for review purposes and talk about why Jesus came. Now pray for me because I'm liable to start shouting right here and maybe not even get to the sermon. But Jesus came to do the will of the Father. Jesus came to reveal God Almighty. Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Jesus came to demonstrate the everlasting love of God. Jesus came that we might have abundant life. Jesus came that our faith and our hope might be in God. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came that we might have everlasting life. Jesus came to lay down his life for his sheep. Jesus came to be our great high priest. Jesus came that we might receive the promise of the blessed Holy Ghost. Jesus came to redeem us. Jesus came to save sinners, of which I am the chief. Jesus came to call sinners to repentance. And Jesus came to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Those are the 15 that we have covered. I will finish this sermon today by covering the last five. I'll take them one through five rather than 16 through 20. Jesus came to forgive us of all of our sins. And since I'm going to be uh, going through a number of scriptures, you won't have to jump up and down. You can just hold your seat. And if the Lord uh, does any preaching good enough for you to get up, you can get up then. Colossians 2, 13. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. The writer is speaking, obviously, to the Israelite believers when they were dead in their transgression and the uncircumcision of their flesh. God made them alive together with Christ, and in so doing, he forgave these believers of all of their transgressions. The first thing I'm going to do is just holler just a little bit because all my sins are forgiven. All of my sins are forgiven. So every now and then, I just feel like hollering out, forgiven, I'm forgiven in Jesus Christ. I would stop there if I, it wasn't my first Sunday back and my wife was looking at me strange. I would stop there, but I, I got to go forward. And in so doing here, the writer doesn't stop, but he touches on the process. God canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which were hostile to us. The Mosaic law had decrees or commands which neither the Israelites nor the Gentiles could keep. And the decrees consisted of debt that we were unable to pay. 
And there you are right there. You say, well, Bishop, you've been telling us, and you had Pastor Darren telling us that we don't have to pay the debt. Now, here the debt comes up. Well, you don't have to pay it. It said that God canceled the certificate of debt that was charged against us and was hostile towards us. Notice that the writer didn't say the debt was paid, but that it was canceled. Praise God that all your debts that were charged to you in the Mosaic law have been canceled in Jesus Christ. I'm already preaching better than you shouting. What's wrong with y'all? Where y'all at? Now, this, there is a definite difference in paying off a debt and in having a debt canceled. The debt was canceled by God since we were buried with Christ and made alive together with him when we resurrected. We die to the debt of the law. The law no longer has any hold on us and God is able to cancel the debt and forgive us of all of our sins written across your debt is not paid in full but cancel there's a difference in somebody paying your debt and it being canceled furthermore god said that he would take the debt out of the way first of all i'm glad that my debts and my sins are forgiven secondly i'm glad that all my debts in him have been canceled now not the one at jc penny's now that one's still you still got to pay that one, but all debts with respect to salvation and sin have been canceled. There's a way that the devil and others try to bring up certain debts that we are and remind you of where you've been and where you came from and what you've been through. But all of those debts have been canceled. Then he said he took them out of the way. The Greek vocabulary is very similar to bearing it away. I don't know if the writer is thinking of Jesus perhaps being the scapegoat and the sins being loaded upon him and him bearing them away so that you will never see them again. I'm so glad that there's no sin that ever is going to come up again in the future and try to lay hold upon me because Jesus has borne every one of them away. You might still remember them, but God said, he would remember them again no more he would cast them into the sea and forget about them he would put them in the small of his back he would stomp on them under his feet our debt has been removed now that's 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 cool that's that's cool enough that's uh i need a word blessed enough but then it says that god nailed the cancel certificate of our debt to the cross, displayed it for all to see for all of eternity. Anytime the devil or anybody attempts to bring up your legal debt, you can simply point them to the cross and say, just go look up there because all of my debt has been canceled and is nailed to the cross. Somebody ought to be praising God right about there. Every one of your debts, every one of our sins has been canceled in the name of Jesus I'm glad about it I said I'm glad about it I feel like preaching some more there but I got to go I'll be stronger next Sunday Jesus came to be the propitiation for our sins First John 4 and 10. And this is love. Not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. While we were, or as humans, we spend much of our time enamored and talking about our love for God. But John said, let me tell you what real love is. Love ain't you loving God. Love is God loving you. He loved you enough to be the propitiation. And the Greek word there literally means the mercy seat in the tabernacle, the portable sanctuary of the Old Testament Israelites. 
There was a holy of holy where the lid of the Ark of the Covenant resided between the outstretched arms of the two cherubim. And the blood of bulls and goats was sprinkled on the mercy seat once a year on Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, to cover the sins of the people. But Jesus is now our mercy seat for our sins. Where as the blood covered our sins, now his blood wipes away and washes away our sins. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other found I know nothing. Jesus' sacrifice takes away the sin of the world. But I begin to ask, how, how is that so? And the writer of the sermon to the Hebrews, although we call it the letter to the Hebrew, it really looks more like a sermon when you study it. He writes in Hebrews 7.25, therefore, he's able. I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't have to go no further. That, that should be signal enough for you to shout right there when I said he's able. You, you should have just started shouting and, and, and pulling out your extensions and going wild because and what, he's an able God. Therefore, he's able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Because he lives forever, he makes in eternal intercession. He's in the presence of God praying for me perennially. Anytime the devil brings something up, God is there in the person of Jesus Christ doing a little lawyering on my behalf. See, and I know what they said about him, but I want you to know that I am the advocate. I'm the lawyer. I'm his go-between. I'm his, uh, uh, his ombudsman. And I don't care what they say about him. I've already died and paid the price. It's nailed to the cross. It's taken care of. The debt is canceled. Hallelujah. So therefore, no matter how far eternity goes, Jesus is in the presence of God arguing on my behalf I'll be better next Sunday it don't take much for me to shout right now I haven't been here I haven't been getting my praise on except in my closet but when you get other folks to join in with you then it brings a whole different hallelujah He ever lives to make. Wait, 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 what was that first one? He did what? What was that first? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, he came to forgive us all of our sin. And then he's the propitiation, the, the hilastrion, the mercy seat for all of our sins. Number three, y'all gonna get out early today. Maybe. Jesus came to be glorified by the Father through facing violence and death to advance his kingdom. I got to go a little deeper this time, y'all forgive me. John 12, 23, and Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and die, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it to eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? Well, for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice out of heaven said, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it. Again, may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Now, you better hang on because I'm going a little different than what y'all normally are used to. Jesus' purpose was going to be fulfilled in this hour. The hour that Jesus is referring to is the hour when he would voluntarily give his life to complete the mission of the Father. The hour would entail his voluntarily submitting himself to the violence of humanity and the violence of the devil that would eventuate in his death upon the cross. The violence didn't come from God. The violence came from us. The violence came from the devil. Don't look at nobody right now, but you're a violent person. 
Everybody that's human has violence down inside of them because of, the, of their, 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 their earthly father, the devil, who's a liar and a murderer and a liar from the beginning. In this glorification, Jesus was like a grain of wheat that falls into the earth and dies so that it might produce much fruit. Consequently, it's like a, a germinating seed. But Jesus explained that following in his footstep means you got to hate your own life and become a servant of the Father. These are two characteristics that Jesus loved and that God loves. But it doesn't mean hate your life literally. It just means that you love God's mission more than you love your own stuff. Okay, they don't want to talk about that. Let's go. But Jesus became troubled about the glorification which would require him to hate his life and to be a servant, even though he knew that he had come into the world for the purpose of being glorified through giving his life. He was torn because he was human. He was the man God and the God man. He was God in the flesh. He was as much God as he, he'd never been man and as much man as if he'd never been God. He was the theanthropic one, born of a hypostatic... I'm, I'm getting excited now. I'm not... I don't know what I'm talking about, of a hypostatic union where there is one, two substance, but one essence that has come together and who he is. But his human side said, I don't want to die. He was not sadomasochistic. He was not asking God to kill him. He was not hoping that God would kill him. He said, in matter of fact, if there's another way we can get this done, maybe we ought to go that way. I don't know what the father said, but all he said is, nevertheless, not as I will. But it's thy will. I ain't trying to die. Now, some of y'all I know are much more spiritual than I. And you want to die. I will preach to you at Easter. This is Christmas. We're trying to get Jesus born right now. We ain't trying to kill him. So later on, when we get ready to kill him and you want to die, you're going, I'm not asking Jesus to die. That'll take care of it all by itself. There's stuff coming that's going to put us to trial. There's stuff coming that's going to ask some stuff from us. And we will be, have to be able to see what we're going to do. And so he says, Father, I, I don't want to die. I, I'm not trying to die. And then he prays. And he don't pray nothing like I would pray. He prays, Father, glorify your name. Now I want you to know, that's very seldom my prayer. I'm happy about the hip replacement surgery. It looked like it's going to be strong. It looked like it's going to be good. But that first couple of weeks... It wasn't looking like that. And I wasn't praying, Father, glorify thy name. That wasn't what I was praying. I was praying, Father, heal, touch, deliver, do something. But I know some of y'all in here, I'm not going to look at you because I don't want you to think I'm talking to you and you'll get mad at me. But some of y'all are even have been praying imprecatory prayers. Like David, Lord, may his house be wiped out. May another man stoop down over his wife. You've been praying imprecatory prayers. I hope that God will destroy you. I hope that, well, I, I, I'm not trying to pray that, but let me tell you, when I'm in trouble, I'm praying something about me. I need some help. I need deliverance. I need it. But Jesus said, Father, glorify your name. Do what's best for your name, not what's best for me. And then God evidently got riled up. And he spoke from heaven and announced and said, I've glorified it before and I'll glorify it again. Evidently, the Father is reminding Jesus, I glorified you before the world began. I'm going to glorify you through the cross and I'm going to glorify you after the cross. I got your glory taken care of. I wish I had some help up in here. I don't know about you, but I, that's what I want to hear from God. When I'm going through stuff and, and it ain't what I think it ought to be and people are treating me unlike what I think I ought to be treated, I want to hear the Father say, I glorified your name. And I'm going to glorify it again. I'm going to take you through what you got to go through. I don't know. Maybe I'm preaching to the wrong folks in here. Is there anybody in here that's going through anything that's been tough or difficult? Is there anybody in here that had to face some difficulty and you needed God to come? and to help you to make it where you want it to be and where you need it to go. If you're here, then stop looking at me like I'm crazy and begin to praise God just a little bit because he's worthy of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 
It's just for me. You don't have to do nothing. You, you just sit there with your own, with your dead self. Go here. It's just me. I ain't been in church in a while. I got, I got some, 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 some praise that been stored up down in here that I just need to let out. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory. Number four, Jesus came to taste death for everyone. Mm. Hebrews 2 and 9. But we do see him who has, was made for a little while lower than angels. Namely, Jesus, Jesus. Because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. So by that, the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. The writer of the Sermon of the Hebrew gives us a wonderful glimpse of Jesus, something that he accomplished. We see Jesus who was made a little lower than angels in the fact that he was made God in the flesh. Because of his suffering death, because he offered himself up voluntarily, he was crowned with glory and with honor. It was through the suffering and crowning through the grace of God that he might taste death for everyone. He tasted death for me. He tasted death for you. He tasted death for those who were trying to do right. He tasted death for those who weren't trying to do right. He tasted death for criminals. He tasted death for those who were up and out. He tasted death for everyone. He has tasted it, so we need no longer taste it. I don't have to worry about what death tastes like. I can just ask Jesus. I don't have to taste it for myself. We have died with him. We have been buried with him. We have born again in him to eternal life. We are walking in the newness of life. And death has no final power over us. I thought somebody would shout death. Now, maybe you don't understand that. Maybe you don't know that because we don't talk about death in America. We don't deal with death much. But I had an experience that kind of helped me to get a little bit better feeling of what that was all about. When, when, when you get this surgery now, they don't do like they used to do. They used to uh, put, uh, incubate you and put tubes down your throat. Now, they don't do that no more. They give you a, 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 a spinal block, and then they give you something to knock you out. And when they give you the spinal block and whatever, all I remember, I was sitting up on the table. They said, we're going to get up here, Mr. Johnson. We're going to give you this spinal block. The next thing I knew, I was in my room, with, and people were standing around my bed looking at me. Said, what, what had What had happened? I was just on the edge of that table. I don't remember nothing else. I woke up with people looking at me. Don't you think that's what death is going to be for us? He said that you are those who have fallen asleep in the Lord. You're going to close your eyes over glory and wake up. Blah, 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 and wake up over there. It won't seem like no time has passed. It won't seem like anything has taken place. I'll close my eyes here and open them up over there. By and by when the morning comes and all the saints of God are gathering home, we'll tell the story of how we overcome and we'll understand it better. By and by when the morning comes, and all the saints of God have gathered home. We'll tell the story of how we overcome and we'll understand it better. By and by. Hallelujah. I don't think you heard me. I said, close your eyes here. Wake up over there. Glory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your glory? Number five. What time we play today? One o'clock, I got to go. Jesus. 
Jesus, I got I I to go. I got to get home. By the way, they got this wonderful thing called, it's like an ice machine. You put ice and water down in it, and it's connected to a pad. And it runs cold water through the pad, so you don't have to be going back to the refrigerator all day. And you just put that back on there. Ooh. I got home and get home to my pad. Five, number five. Number five, number five, number five. Number five. Actually, number 20. But number five, Jesus came to bear witness to the truth. John 18, 37, therefore Pilate said to him, so you are a king? And Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I've come to the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who was of the truth hears my voice. In a world where the President of the United States rarely tells the truth, In a world, I, I, I didn't make that up. That's according to the fact, che the, the fact checkers. And by the way, you might, you might just, just some extra uh, information for you for Jeopardy. They've been fact checking presidents since 1927. That didn't just start. They thought that they had fact checked Obama more than any president before him. But since Trump, he's the most fact checked president ever. And we find out, I'm going to give you the statistics later on, that he rarely tells the truth. In an age where the president rarely tells the truth, in an age where the distillation of an agency's point of view from a news perspective is filtered through their own perspectives. You watch CNN, they saying one thing. You go to Fox, they saying something else. You go to CNNBC, they saying something else. What is the truth? Jesus said, I came to bear witness to the truth. I'm almost done, but can I give y'all previews of coming attractions? When you have the movies, they always give you that last little preview. So you can see what's coming on. And for those of y'all who go to the Avengers movie, if you don't know, don't walk out until after the very last credit. Because there's going to be a preview at the end. I'm coming on my Martin Luther King, Jr. King sermon. I'm, uh, God's given me a fantastic scripture. I'm just going to mention it now for preview. Isaiah 59 and 14. Justice is turned back. Righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the street, and uprightness cannot enter. My theme is going to be truth toppled. And I want to be talking about the fact that you can't have social justice without truth. And the text here said, two, three thousand years ago, truth has stumbled in the street. Truth has stumbled in the public square, so that you can't hardly find truth anymore. What is truth? I don't know if anybody knows anymore or if we ever even care. But truth is fact that has been verified. God's facts are verified. He said, how did he verify them? He verified them through the life, through the death, through the burial, through the resurrection, and the ongoing intersection of, intercession of Jesus through the Holy Ghost. He was born like God said he would be born. He lived like God said he would live. He died like God said he would die. He was buried in a borrowed tomb like God said he would be. Early one Sunday morning, he got up like God said he would get up. He walked the streets of, 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 of Galilee and Jerusalem like God said he would. And he rose up and ascended up on high like God said he would. He sent the Holy Ghost back. 
like God said he would. That's fact. That's fact that has been verified by reality. And therefore, according to the revelation of God. I, I, I got to go. I can't stay. Uh, according to the, God revealed himself to Moses. Glory. And said, look, I'm abounding in truth. I, I'm compassionate. I'm long-suffering. I'm abounding in truth. I'm full of truth. If you want to know what truth is, you need to get with God. Then Jesus is the living truth. I, I, I'm not getting no amens right there. If you want to know what truth is, you got to get with the living truth. Uh, what CNN's telling you ain't living. Uh, what Fox News is telling you is not alive. There is a truth that is alive. As in Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And the word of God is the written truth. You shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. Let me just ask a question before I quit. Is there anybody in here who wants to be free? If you want to be free, then you have to understand you got to know the truth. Well, wait, wait, wait a minute. When he didn't say you need to learn the truth, he said you need to know the truth. He didn't say you need to think about the truth. He said you need to know the truth. You need to know experientially. You need to know intimately. You need to know personally. You need to know the truth. You need to come into living relationship with the truth of God Almighty. Hallelujah. And when you know the truth, the truth shall set you free. Free from all hurt, harm. They free, no more chains binding me. Free, thank God. I'm free from the stuff the devil's trying to do, from the bondages that the world wants to put upon me, free from the physical ailments and stuff that takes place in my life, free because of salvation that God has given me. I'm looking for about five people who are glad that you're free today and who don't mind giving a Christmas shout to the fact that you are free because Jesus came and was born and lived and died and was buried and resurrected and ascended and he's coming again so soon. Thank you for the freedom. We've covered 20 reasons that Jesus came in the flesh. Please don't be fooled. There are many more. I just had to stop the sermon series somewhere. I know that I thought maybe I could get five a Sunday in. We could cover 20. And then I'd have to cut it off. But there are many. Christmas time is the time to celebrate. All the reasons that Jesus came in the flesh. Now the day of salvation. Come to Jesus now. Every head bowed. Every eye closed. People moving who are moving into place. So that folks may have the opportunity to trust in the Savior. The reason we're here today is that it's Christmas time and we want you to have the opportunity to know Jesus. The one who came down, the Baptist would say, through 40 and two generations so that you might come to know him. All you got to do is say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for every sin that I've sinned against you. Come in my life, save me. Make me the person you want me to be. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. I receive you as Savior and Lord. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. We pray that in a minute. These are all to workers here. They just want to pray with you. That's all. Hope you know what it means to trust in Jesus. You just get up and come down. They'll, they'll meet you. They'll be glad to meet you. 
If you need a church home, we give you that opportunity. Me, recognizing over the past four weeks going to rehab and coming through surgery and all of that process, I recognize that I, nothing is promised. But what we have are gifts from God Almighty.